Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the Still Loading Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Koval. I'm putting this little intro in the beginning here just as a little bit of a, I guess, a disclaimer, for lack of a better term. Like this, I started this show back in 2014. Uh, this audio, I, I had a very different audio setup. I had a co host at the time. A lot of things have changed. So, this isn't so much a disclaimer as to say like, oh, this is a bad episode or don't listen to it, but more or less just know, don't let this be, let this be the uh, indication or this is not indicative of what the show is now. Uh, I guess as a random, I shouldn't say random, as a starting off point where I would say my show really found its voice, it was in 2020, so it took like it took like six years, uh, 2020, um, the summer of PS2, I did a big celebration for 20 years of the, the, for the 20th anniversary, excuse me, of the PlayStation 2, episode 146, where I covered Jack and Daxter, it was the first time I went weekly on the podcast, and so I would say that is kind of where the show started to gain its form. And there's stuff before that that's good too, so feel free to explore. But I would say to get an idea of like what the show is now and what the kind of show has turned into, I would I would suggest starting there. Also, the first few episodes does not have the theme song in it. I'm going to put it in after this whole thing here is done, but I wanted to give you a forewarning that you're going to hear it soon, but you might not hear it for the first few episodes. But that's it. That's uh, all the disclaimer I have for you. I hope you enjoy this first episode if you uh, give it a listen. And check out all the other episodes, of course. I I've had a lot of fun doing this over the years, and I hope you go down the rabbit hole and see what all Still Loading has to offer. What all Still Loading has never fully loaded, I guess. <laughs> Hey guys, this is Josh. And this is Justin. And this is our first podcast for our Still Loading channel. Uh, we're incorporated, whatever you want to call us. Uh, I guess to start off with what we are, Still Loading, uh, we're just two friends who really, really love gaming and geek culture. And so we started a Let's Play series on YouTube, which we'll have links in the description and everything. And we started doing podcasts. This is, and like I said, this is our first one. Um, and so what we wanted to do our first podcast on was a convention uh, Justin and I both went to recently called Too Many Games. Too Many Games is a gaming convention based around Philadelphia area. It's in Oaks, PA. Uh, definitely check it out. It's a great con, but we're going to go into more of that later. I figured the best way to start this out is just really to describe where we stand in terms of uh, like how we kind of started as a gamer, like what really got us into games, and what we do right now, and what we went to college for, and what we do right now. So, Justin, you can start off. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I grew up on gaming. I don't think there's ever a time in my life where video games weren't a part of it. In fact, a really big part of it, and I'm really thankful for that. Um, and it just kind of carried through until this day. Uh, it influenced my decision to major in comp sci at our Acadia University, <clears throat> and also uh, that's what I do now. I'm a software designer, um, but I still love games. Uh, I love music and games, which inspired me to also foolishly double major as a music and comp sci major, and uh, yeah. All right, so then... Uh... What I have done, I didn't grow up on games as much as Justin did. I knew about games. I had friends who owned consoles. Uh, I had neighbors and friends. Everyone, just everyone but me pretty much had consoles. Uh, I played a couple. We had like an old Macintosh, but for the most part, I really wasn't heavy into games until my parents got me an N64 when I was around 10 or 11 years old. And so I kind of missed off on the, all the great games on the Super Nintendo and the NES and the Genesis and the Master System. Uh, I know, I know it's horrible, <laughs> but you got to start somewhere, right? Yep. So uh, I started out on the N64, and then I went to college, actually, for game design. Uh, God help me, I'm 
Sadly not doing game design as my occupation right now, I am currently doing criminal background checks. Still entertaining, oh, nonetheless. Yes. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of where we stand and where we started out as. Uh, pretty much, and I guess the best thing now is to say what we want to do with this podcast. So our podcast is going to talk about anything and everything related to geek culture. Anything you might find within the con circuit. Doctor Who, I mean, I, I'm... I'm into Doctor Who. You haven't really watched it, Justin. Yeah, I'm sad to say I haven't gotten into it yet. I definitely plan to. It's just my schedule's so crazy. And I know when people start watching Doctor Who, they just marathon watch that to death. So I know what I'm getting into. And I just want to make sure I have the time for it. And I will make time for it. But yeah, so, I mean, that's just an example. But obviously games, we both said we love, we're love. we gamers, we love video games. Uh, we both like anime or anime, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, anything. And if there's anything that we don't cover that you guys would like us to, because we'll do research on it. I'm not. We're not going to pretend that we are magical beings that know everything about Ooh. the things that you love. <laughs> But, you know, we'll look into it. Maybe maybe we'll find out we actually enjoy it more than we thought we would. That kind of thing. So, yeah, that is our goal for our podcast. And I guess now is the best time to start talking about too many games. Yeah, and it was a blast, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, we went there. It was a three-day convention, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, typical deal. Uh, and it's pretty much a showroom type of convention. It's For the most part, it's just a gigantic dealer's room. With a few small rooms for panel... I think there's only two panel rooms. Yeah. Two panel rooms and a concert hall. And that was it. It wasn't any huge convention that had tons of panels. And, like, some of you... I probably... I remember some had, like, multiple concert halls, depending. Oh, yeah. So, it, there's some pretty... It was a pretty small con, but it was a very, very good one. Yeah, it was small but really effective. And... Yeah, like Josh said, there's only two panel rooms. That's just the design of the convention center itself. It's definitely more catered towards, like, more of an expo center than, like, a panel and, like, convention center. Well, that's why it's the Philadelphia Expo Center. (laughs) Exactly. But, uh, but yeah, so uh, we were surprised because usually expos or uh, showroom type of conventions are generally not the best on panels. Uh, but what we're going to go through is just kind of talk about our day-to-day experience. Uh, our first day was Friday, and we went to a couple panels. I think the one that stuck out to me most, we went to see Retronauts, The Life and Times of the 3DO. I'm a Retronauts fan. They do their own podcast. They are probably one of the most well-known retro gaming podcasts out there right now. Uh, they, recent, they recently started back up through a very successful Kickstarter, so definitely check them out because they, they know far more than, I, than either of us yeah, do. Yeah, far more. But they're, they're super interesting. They're so fun to listen to, and they have a really catchy theme song by Anna Managuchi. Which is awesome. <laughs> which is amazing, or Anna Managuchi. Uh, but they talked about the 3DO, which I didn't know much about the 3DO, so it was really cool to talk about the incep- in the inception of what, or inception, sorry, conception of the inception, <laughs> 3DO inception. <laughs> no, uh, it was interesting to talk to hear them talk about how 3DO came to be. Who Trip Hawkins, the guy who started EA, uh, who founded EA, is basically the brainchild behind the 3DO. He's the one that wanted to do it. So it was really interesting to hear all about uh, Trip Hawkins and his progression through that. Yeah, and honestly, I mean, who really knows that much about the 3DO? Uh, it was kind of like the forgotten child of 3D gaming, unfortunately, even though there were some pretty interesting things we've learned from that panel. Yeah, they actually had a handful of decent to average games. They yeah. weren't all a pile of trash. And they, like a lot of them were like the first to use licensed music. Like I think one of the games used Soundgarden as one of their tracks, which... As coming from a musical background, it's pretty interesting to see the time when games started to use licensed music. And the first one I think about is Tony Hawk. Yeah, that's the first one I can think of, too. Um, some of the other panels that we saw there, oh, we didn't actually see, but they were there, sorry. Uh, classic Gaming with Modern Conveniences. That one was supposed to be all about pretty much how you play retro games or just, you know, the classics with an HGTV or just or in modern days like how people do that uh another ones were collecting for growth acknowledging an ever-expanding retro gaming market which I don't know if it's 
no, it's not ironic. It's coincidental, but it's yes. still funny <laughs> that uh, that the people who ran the panel, they're called Cerulean Games, I believe, yes, were the that's... most overpriced dealers in the entire yeah. convention. Not trying to knock them. I'm sure they're super nice people, and the, but and the stuff they were was a little really pricey. Good. Like, the, their boxes were in immaculate condition and oh, everything. Yeah. But... The stuff was phenomenal looking, but the prices, I'm just like... Yeah. <laughs> it was like, it, because the boxes were so good, they it warranted such a higher price. Maybe that's just the price of collecting, but I don't know. For me... I can't warrant an extra fifty dollars just because the box doesn't have a tiny scratch on it. Like, exactly. I'd rather have a box with a tiny scratch and pay fifty dollars less than have one extra thing taken away from it, and all of a sudden the price just skyrockets. Yeah, because to me, it's more about the nostalgic value of playing those games on the actual console on an old tube TV. Like, I don't need to spend the extra money to have all the like luxuries with it, unless I find exactly. it at a pretty good price. Uh, but there's other things going on Friday. They had, tur- like, video game tournaments. They had Smash, the original Smash Brothers for the 64. They had a Duck Hunt tournament, which I think is freaking awesome. Yeah, that's brilliant. I I want more Duck Hunt tournaments. Um, They also had a burlesque show, which we did not attend. We were we literally worked, or at least I worked a half day at my job and went drove straight to it. So I was kind of exhausted getting there. Uh, and we, it was tiring so we couldn't really say for that i mean who would want to miss a burlesque show let's be real especially with luigi and mario i believe were there Uh, (laughs) i don't swing that way i'm sorry (laughs) but uh so the first night we were there that's pretty much all we can really talk about the panels there because we only got to see one and the rest of it we just spent on the dealers floor because it was so cool to see all the different things they had oh yeah and that's the great thing about like go into the convention like the first day because usually the first day is just a warm-up day get your feet wet kind of get yourself familiar with the surroundings know where the panel rooms are know where the good dealers are um get your eyes on a couple things early so that when you go first thing saturday you're already a step ahead of everyone else exactly and it was it was just a ton of fun. And one of the I think my favorite highlights of Friday is we met DJ Cutman. Yeah, that's right. He uh, was awesome. He was so cool. Uh, definitely check out. He has his own game label or game label, sorry, record label that specializes in video game remixes called Game Chops, and they're awesome. Yeah. Uh, we at in the transition between our Friday segment right now into the Saturday, and we'll play a little bit of his. Who is it? I can't pronounce the guy's name, but he does a remix of a bunch of Mega man songs and they're awesome we'll include a link with his actual name into it because i can't really pronounce it because yeah it's, it, there's a certain way to pronounce it but well it's I like, totally blanked out on how it's to like, actually pronounce it's it. like a and then a bunch of consonants there's no yeah. vowels in any so it's like <laughs> so but. but his remixes are phenomenal so we'll play a little clip of them in between today or the friday our friday portion of this and the saturday one but dj cutman was super cool he was so fun to talk to he was very down to earth and he was so willing to just tell you how he got into it yeah it's awesome to see people like that at a convention and the important thing too is just talk to everyone you see at a convention they could be someone like dj cutman like I think when we approached him, we were a little unsure if he actually was DJ Cutman. You could kind of tell because he had, like, the helmet with him and stuff like that. But he wasn't wearing the helmet. It was just off to the side. Yeah, so it was like, all right, well, let's just talk to him, see who he is, and it turned out to be him. And, like, we actually had a really good, decent, long conversation with him, and it really inspired me to like, kind of check out like Game Chops, his record label, and um, just kind of poke around in that industry to see what it's all about. And now I'm really interested in it. So I kind of feel like I got the information I needed to get a good foundation to maybe start looking into remix and video game music. Or creating your own chip tunes. Yes, that too. Uh, so yeah, that pretty much covers it for our Friday portion of this. Uh, we are now going to move on to our Saturday. Alright, peace. Thank you. 
so that, like we said, was a remix of a Mega Man song. I'm trying to remember. It was Infinity... M- 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 I can I can't, never I can't, pronounce it. It's from one of the Mega Man X games. Yeah, I XX, I believe. XX. He knows. He's the Mega Man fan out of the two of us. I love Mega Man, but I don't know nearly as much as him. Oh, Mega Man's my life. It's, but that's another story yeah, for that's another a story day. Story for another day, exactly. But yeah, so Saturday we hit up the dealer's room again because it was that was the long day. It started at 11 a.m. Didn't close till what eight? Yeah, it went to eight. Uh, actually, or, seven, yeah, seven, seven, eight o'clock. Um, but yeah, so we saw a couple different things. Uh, Justin here went to a ton of panels. What panels did you go to? Who man. Uh, most of them were all music panels, because like I said, music's a big uh, part of my life as well, so uh, combining video games and music was like a match made in heaven for me. But um, I saw Game Chop's Ultimate Super VGM panel music, which was really cool. They had uh, DJ Cutman, um, Kevin... Felicio, uh, Ralph, and uh, Ben Benjamin Briggs, uh, all from the Game Chops label, uh, and they were just going over like how to remix video game music and stuff, which I found really interesting. Um, I went to an LSDJ panel, which is making chiptune music on Game Boys, which was really cool. Uh, that was hosted by Storm Blooper, a uh, chiptune artist from Philly. I uh, also went to uh, the Let's Make Video Game Music panel, which Josh joined me later, and that was a ton that of fun. That was amazing. We, uh, the guy who hosted it basically told us, hey, give me an idea for a game. It doesn't have to be good or anything unique, but just give me a concept for a game. Let's create a couple tracks. Let's create a track based around that concept. And I didn't really like our idea. It was like dinosaurs in space with disco balls and 70s music. Yeah, it was... Oh, I mean, don't get me wrong, that sounds hilarious, yeah. but, like, dinosaurs in space. You see, like, I'm not saying you see that everywhere, but you... That, that feels like something, like, that you would see everywhere on the internet. Yeah, exactly. Everywhere. Pretty unoriginal. But, uh... So, I mean, other than that, it was really cool, because we it basically almost turned into abuse the composer, because he'd be like, all right, what instrument do you want to put in here? And someone would yell out, oh, let's get a saxophone. He's like, I don't have any saxophone samples, which is surprising, because he has, like, every other sample. Yeah, including a didgeridoo. Yeah, I yelled out a didgeridoo, and he's like, yeah, I got that. I'm like, how do you not have a saxophone? Well, whatever, it was awesome. And so we, we put a didgeridoo into the mix. It actually kind of works, surprisingly. Yeah, actually, didgeridoo is a really good sub for, uh, what is it, uh, the dubstep bass woofer. You can actually use a didgeridoo Didn't for that. Didn't he use it for, like, a folk dubstep thing or something? Yeah, it was uh, something bizarre, but he used the didgeridoo folk as... Folk dubstep, the wave of the future. <laughs> Seriously. That's what the hipsters are going to call it. <laughs> uh, but, uh... Yeah, so it was it was really cool because we, we someone yelled out bagpipes. He threw some bagpipe samples in. It was really interesting. So that was a cool panel. Yeah, um, and the impressive thing is it actually kind of worked. Surprising, and that wasn't nearly like a representation of how good the audience was. That guy who mixed it all that was all on him. He yeah. took the worst possible instruments with a really bizarre idea and somehow made it you feel like you were a dinosaur in space in the 70s that had a disco ball for a stomach. Go figure. The more you find. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was one other panel I remember you went. It was the... Let me see here. Where was this one? Oh, the... Uh, Screen, Screen Wave. Wave. That yeah. was it. Grow an audience on YouTube. Tell a little bit about that. Yeah, that one was really interesting because, as we said before, uh, we're trying to also do Let's Play videos on YouTube. Um, but this panel was great because it was actually hosted by Mike Matei, who is the uh, almost one of the like pro- the co-producer of, yeah, exactly. of, the, of the Angry Video Game Nerds website. Yeah, and like all of Cinemas- Cinemassacre and things like that. Um, so it was really interesting just to hear them speak about YouTube and all the ins and outs of it. And just hearing that knowledge from someone who's so well known in the industry... And has so mm-hmm. much knowledge in it. So that was an awesome, informative panel. Yeah, so if you uh, if you guys ever want to start your own thing, like, 
I don't even know if anyone's going to listen to this, but if you want to get your name out there, go check out a panel at a con or something like that. Because there was one I remember one our one friend went to, and it was pretty much just telling you how to make money on YouTube as opposed to how to actually get an audience, how to get fans, how to get people interested in what you care about and how or interested in how you present what you care about. Mm -hmm. And that's what this panel, the way he described because I didn't get to go to it, but that's how he described it. I'm like, that's actually that's useful that's not just yeah, telling exactly. you here make money no, no no it was actually telling you if you care about something and you want people to know how much you care about it and you want to do it in a unique way this is how you do it and it was awesome exactly and of course everyone wants to make money i mean that's required to live sure but you know if you're just if that's your ultimate goal and that's the only goal you're chasing you're gonna burn out like exactly you got to do what you're passionate about and you know, if that makes you a little bit extra money on the side, that's awesome. Exactly. Um, some of the panels I went to, I only actually got to go to... Did I go to... I only actually went to one panel. I went to a couple concerts, though. Uh, or no, only one concert today. It was a bunch of concerts on Sunday. Yeah. But the one panel I went to was... It was all right. They, they were a little dry with the delivery on it, but it basically the panel was about... Nintendo year 1994. The games they came out for, the things that were announced, uh, some of the points they mentioned. Just I'm gonna go over briefly because I it was a couple days ago now, so I can't 100% remember. But they talked about uh, Donkey Kong Country was released, Super Metroid was released, and those are huge games. Those were huge games for the Super Nintendo. And on on the flip side, however, they also announced the Virtual Boy, and we all know where that went. Yeah, <laughs> if any of you actually remember the Virtual Boy. <laughs> but, uh, actually, it's funny. My neighbor, two houses down, had a Virtual Boy. Actually, the same exact scenario for me. Uh, neighbor down the street had a Virtual Boy. And I actually thought it was the coolest thing. Yeah, so did I. But now I'm looking at him like, ah, that would give me a headache. Yeah, I don't know how exactly. I did that as a kid. Like, we didn't own it, so we didn't have the privilege, I should of say. Of getting a headache from yeah, it. Exactly, trying to squint at a red screen and a tiny helmet thing. Yeah. <sighs> so I just remember they had it set up on a windowsill. So I sat down at the windowsill and I would just play it right there. And it, it, it worked, but it was still kind of... Mm. Anyway, uh, so that was interesting. That was a cool panel. I also saw Chipocrit. He is a chiptune artist from Philly and he's been he's been getting up there in the chiptune business. He's done a couple game soundtracks. Um, I can't remember any off the top of my head, but he's making a name for himself within the chiptune industry. Mm -hmm. um, and he does a pretty cool thing too. Like he actually will, you know, run the chiptunes off his Game Boy, live. and then um, also play guitar to it, kind of like a Danimal Cannon, who's also a really good chiptune artist, which I think he's based out of Buffalo, New York. But uh, check these guys out. They Really talented, both musically and programmically. Because <laughs> the, <laughs> the if you ever look at like the LSDJ software for Game Boy, you actually need like some programming background. So it's kind of cool. Uh, other than that, I didn't really see too much on Saturday. Uh, there, like I said, I saw Chipper and I saw the panel. I wanted to see Spoonie was there. For those who like Spoonie, I've actually. I only just heard him about him like a month ago. Surprisingly, I'm surprised I never heard of Spoonie before because he's apparently really popular. But uh, he was there and he had a Spoonie Rifts Final Fantasy uh, panel, which I really wanted to go to because I saw a bit of his Final Fantasy videos of him like riffing Final Fantasy VIII and everything, and I really wanted to see it. But by the time I got out of the Chipocrit concert, the line was backed up to forever, and I'm just forget this. I'm I'm not doing. It. I'm not dealing with this. <laughs> yeah, and that's the shame about with some of these smaller expo conventions. The panel rooms can get filled up pretty quick. So On the flip side, though, it was super cool. I noticed Friday night. I think you you had left because you had to go somewhere. I forget. Yeah, mm -hmm. you had to go somewhere for a little bit, but you came back. Spoonie, Spoonie's booth was totally empty, except for just him and some guy just talking. It was, it was just some fan talking to him. And at a larger con, you would never get to do that. He'd be flooded the whole time. Yeah. But no, he's just chilling there, talking with a fan, and they're just having a normal con. I mean, I didn't hear the conversation, but I assume it was a fairly normal one. Yeah. And you don't get, like, that's what I like about small cons. Like, you get to meet the celebrity, or I don't even call them celebrities, fan liberties, yeah. as Uncle Yo calls them. <laughs> Uncle Yo's a geek-specific comedian. Check him out. Awesome stuff. Shout out. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, so it was really, it was really cool. And I'm just sad I didn't get to talk to too many people. But, um, 
overall, it was Saturday was an awesome day. I mean, I, I got a bunch of stuff to add to my collection. I spent way too much money. Oh, totally yes. worth it, but uh, way too much it's money. Ex- it's to be expected when you go to a con like this. But uh, the only thing I regret on Saturday is not seeing Bit Brigade. They are an amazing band, which we will talk more about them during our Sunday segment. So, uh, so now we're going to head over to that, but in between we're going to play one of the artists that we saw on Sunday called Megaran. Here's some of his stuff. Peace. <laughs> And we're here for the Sunday part portion of this. Uh, what you just heard was Avalanche by Megaran, who samples video game music and creates his own rap songs. And it's not always necessarily specifically about the video game, but it's about his own personal experiences. Justin, you know a lot more about him than I do. Yeah, I've listened... I actually got hooked on Megaran from his Final Fantasy album called Black Materia. And he primarily did a lot of Mega Man music first, hence the name Mega Ran. Um, but yeah, he just samples a lot of video game music from Nintendo to, I would say, current games as well. Uh, mainly stays in the retro area. But he actually got licensed from Capcom themselves to sample whatever music he wants from their library, which is unheard of I mean especially for an indie artist he's not signed by anyone he produces all his music himself yeah so it was really impressive um and I really don't like that much rap or hip hop music but his stuff is just so good that it doesn't even matter (laughs) well it's funny when you you find you like something that you didn't before when they either rapping something that is actually relatable and I don't even talk about game stuff like he raps about his own life yeah a lot. real he, personal stuff too exactly it's really cool and like just kind of makes you think you're on the same like plane as him exactly and granted you can relate to it more if you're into gaming because he uses sounds and music that you're familiar with which brings you into his own genre i would say of hip-hop or rap and i love that I, i'm not huge into rap either but his stuff was just so much and he was so much fun live oh he yeah. had a great live show yeah really got the audience involved like scanning our hands moving and just real interactive it was really cool and he's such a down-to-earth guy like i went up to him before he went up on stage and had a really nice just a little five-minute conversation with him told him how much his music meant to me um, and everything, and he just felt so honored and humbled by it, and it was, it's just really cool to see people in that element. Yeah, uh, and the other band that we saw, like I said in the Saturday segment, I would bring up more here, is Bit Brigade. The only reason I enunciate that so much is because I am horrible at saying it since it's a tongue It's a twist. tough name to say. Bit Brigade. <laughs> Bit Brigade. But, so the whole, I guess their spiel, their gimmick, is yeah, that oof. they will speed speed run a game live while during their concert while they're playing they're playing all the music for the game while someone is speed running it so the game they played for us uh which on sunday show was mega man 2 they had legend of zelda on saturday oh, apparently which i would have loved one. to yeah. see but uh they did mega man 2 and it was freaking awesome yeah they oh, they the guy was nuts like i i remember because i all right a bit of a confession here I love Mega Man 2. I've never beaten it. Like I said, I didn't get to grow up with it, so I only really started playing a lot of retro games recently, so I started getting into Mega Man, and I love Mega Man 2. I've got... I finally got into the Wily stages. It took me a while to get there, but, Very like, nice. I can... I finally got into the Wily stages, so I'm progressing. But, uh... It was just crazy, because the order he fights the bosses, I'm just like, why would you... Oh, this is a speedrun. Everything's totally different than the way I would. Like, he goes for the Metal Blade first. I get that. It's the most overpowered weapon in the game. You're gonna go for that right off that. But then he chooses, what, was it Quick Man stage? With the, yeah, the, with the laser beams. Like, I would have expected him to get the time stop uh, from Flashman, right? Yep. Flashman. I'm sorry, I'm still bad with the names on here, but... 
they got the general idea. It was awesome. And so, and watching them play the music is so much more fun because they, they have a hard rock metal sound to them, but without all the screaming. And it made the game so much more intense. Yeah, it made some sections so epic. Like, I remember when he was getting close, I think like the second or third Wily stage, and it, like you could tell it was building up, and the band just flawlessly like got that impression and just went with it. And it was just like, holy crap, Like we're getting close to Dr. Wily. I've never felt this before playing Mega Man. What is this? It was great. It was one, some of the best stuff I've ever heard. It was awesome. Yeah, and they even did like breakdowns for certain songs. Just real subtle breakdowns. I'm not talking like the big metal yeah, like it, breakdown not, drops. But... Not just dropping a whole section on you. It was just kind of nice in the background. Kind yeah, of like, got you a little bit more into it. Yeah, like they kind of went into a half time every once in a while. and It just broke it up and... I mean, they would play the boss theme for, like, two seconds because the speedrun guy would just be like, okay, boss dead. Yeah. And so it's just like, boss theme, okay, next stage. And just to keep up like that, like, changing songs in the middle of a phrase, that's really impressive work. Which I don't know why I didn't notice it before. The reason they're able to do that so well, the drummer can watch the guy playing it from where he's... I don't know why it didn't hit me during the show. Yeah. I was watching a live performance on YouTube of them, and I'm like, wait... The drummer has it. Oh my goodness! Yeah. And like, how did I not notice that? Yeah. So, so essentially, the guy speed running it is facing the crowd. So the TV that he's playing on is facing the band, and then they also have the, the live feed on the projector. Yeah. So the crowd can see what's going on too. So definitely, at least look them up on YouTube to just get a better idea a of what fun, we're talking it's about. It's a fun show. Because it's a good show yeah, if you love video games and you love music. And the game, the music that comes from video games, it's a real treat to see these guys live. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that I'm. That's all I got for Sunday. Did you have anything else to add on Sunday? No, nah, I mean Sunday was our concert day for sure. It was just a nice like round out weekend. I mean, we got a lot of stuff, spent a lot of money. Actually, I think this is the first time either of us haggled at dealers. Yeah, and they're really willing to. Yeah, I was kind of surprised by that. I mean, most cons, you can kind of haggle with a dealer because they want to move their inventory. And if you have cash, definitely works a little bit better. Oh, because there's no tax. They don't yeah. charge for extra for credit cards. Yeah, and dealers they're love more will- cash. Yeah. It's so much easier for them. Mm-hmm. And I like I've but I've never been to a convention where they say give us a price. Like where they they're literally asking you to haggle with them on a price for the game. Like I remember uh I mean this group didn't have it. I picked up a copy of Skies of Arcadia, which I've heard nothing but good things about. I've really wanted to try it. I'm playing it now and I love it so far. But uh the guy wanted 70 for it. I'm like that seems a little high. I wonder how much it's going for on eBay. Checked it out on eBay. 50, 55 bucks average. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. So I asked him, like, would you be willing to come down on Because it's only like 50 to 55 here on eBay. So he's like, would you do 60? I'm like, thinking 5 to 10 extra bucks for the convenience, the amount of time that it would take for shipping. Sometimes they charge shipping. Yep. And maybe I'd even have to still bid on it if it's not a buy it now. I'll take it. Yeah, 10 bucks it's off. It's easier to return to a dealer than ebay and stuff like oh, that yeah. but it's a really good point to always check something like ebay before smartphones are your best friend with this yeah exactly like see what the average prices are on and also set your own limit if you really want a particular thing at a con and you're okay with spending a little extra money to get it you know that's a personal choice and um definitely go for it i mean but still shop around exactly. like exactly I'm sure for all collectors out there that we might be preaching to the choir, we might be just being annoying with this, but for those who are interested in getting collecting, when you go to buy things anywhere, not just cons, but anywhere, like, I know people always say, oh, shop around, but no, literally, shop around. We cannot stress this enough, because... Even just at the convention, I was trying to find a copy of Super Metroid in the box. I still never got it because I was still trying to keep a budget on it because I would rather get a quantity of th- a quantity of things I'm interested in as opposed to just two or three things I really wanted. Yeah. I mean, that would be nice, but that's also a lot of money for la- very little in return. Excuse me. 
uh, when I was searching for Super Metroid, I saw one guy selling it for 90 another guy was selling it for 70 and they're practically identical. I'm like, what? Well, how yeah. can you charge someone 20 extra dollars? So the point is, is just look around because exactly. you never know what you're going to find. Yeah, I found uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 The Manhattan Project for, I believe, 20 at one dealer, and I scooped it right up because I know that was a little less than the average price. And the same twenty two. Yeah, and the same dealer had the second game, which is actually a lot more common, for twenty five dollars. I was like, ooh, that was a whole lot. Yeah, so definitely at least just do some basic research just to know a guideline. Because I mean, there is a definitely a convenience for getting something right at the dealer's room. You can see the condition, like you can see the physical item uh, if it's a mobile game like if you have your game boy with you you can test it out right there to make sure Mm -hmm. it works um so there's definitely a ton of convenience to that but i mean definitely don't be afraid to say hey i got twenty dollars in my wallet would you take that instead of 25 you You got a good deal in the Mega Man games for the game boy yeah it was the very last day of the convention which is also the best time to haggle because they're trying to get as much of the kids and they don't have as much to take back with them yeah exactly and i only had i think 22 dollars left in cash and uh i saw dealer selling Mega Man one and two for the game boy and they're like oh you want both of these uh both for 30 I'm like, I'm sorry, I only have $22. They're like, uh, sure, we'll take it. All right, cool. $8 off? I mean, I'm not going to say you're going to be able to drop a price of like $30 off a game, but $10, 15 that's, yeah. that's about as good as you're going to get sometimes. Sometimes yeah. dealers are super negotiable, but I yeah. doubt you'd get higher than that. Exactly. And if they say no, don't worry about it. I mean, Move at on. least, yeah, at least give it a shot. I mean, if you constantly save 5 to $10 on each item you purchase that could be two or three more items you go home with for your budget exactly so yeah overall the convention was phenomenal we loved it we want we can't wait for next year we want to go back it's going to be a great time next year and i'm hoping i'm really hoping they're able to bring back just as many good music artists have just as many good panels i mean you never know what's going to happen but for the first convention that I've or this I'm not the first convention I've been to, but the first time I've been to this convention, it really impressed me. Yeah, it really did. It had everything I look for in a convention. Um just the culture of it. Like I love going to cons just to be immersed in that culture for a weekend. Uh it's just awesome to be surrounded by people that love the same things you do. And uh, with the concerts they had, all the guests they had, it was just a really well-rounded convention for a really good price. 30 bucks for the whole weekend. You yeah. can't beat that. Exactly. You look at, like, I mean, I love Wizard World 2 and Comic-Con, stuff like that, but you're looking at, like, $55 for a day. And most of the time, they don't really even have panels. It's just a big dealer's room. It's like, yeah. why am I paying $60 just to spend more money? Exactly. Makes no sense. Yeah, so, I mean, definitely if there's, like, conventions in your area that are still kind of gaining traction, check them out because they're more often than not really awesome. And it's the time where you can actually engage with the guests and learn about them. Like, I remember our first time, well, my first time at ZenkaiCon, which is another convention. Now based in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Yeah, um, they were much smaller than they are now. And I met so many people that are in the dubbing business for anime. Yeah, voice Voice acting. acting, And uh, just to get to meet those people one-on-one, like, I don't think I've had that chance again since those early years where I started going. Well, because when when you first went... uh, they think there was only like... uh, There was only like 500 people that went to the convention. Yeah, it's crazy to think about. Now they, I think they hit like four thousand yep. with the the this last year, one, which so like is awesome. Time, oh yeah, it's great because I mean they can get more high profile stars, uh, mm-hmm. more musical guests, a bigger venue. Like I remember being crammed in that. They had to split up the floors because we were so, like no, on the that, first that was floor the year after floor. that we went too. Yeah, the, actually it was funny. So quick side story before we wrap up. Uh, the one year we went to Zenkai Con, before it moved, it was in. It was in uh, the Valley Forge Convention Center yep. in uh, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. 
and they had to split us up because the con was kind of was getting bigger and they also had Vic McNon Vic- I can't yeah, pronounce Vic- his last Mc- name Mc- but Mc- you may yeah. all know him as Edward Eldrick and I apologize for if I offend anyone for mispronouncing his last name but you all know who I'm talking about Edward Eldrick he's in a ton of stuff yeah, he's in so much, so much stuff, stuff. Uh, but he's best known for Ed yep and uh, anyway so he was there so it was a big one but <laughs> Since they split us up into different floors, they didn't put it consecutively. It wasn't floor one and two or two and three. It was just one and three. And the middle floor two was a business convention. Yeah. So these two, so all these high profile business people in really nice yeah, suits nice and suits everything, everything. And cosplayers and geeks, and they're just sandwiched between them. <laughs> and it was hysterical. Oh, yeah. Just it's... to see their faces. It was beautiful. Yeah. One of my favorite things about going to conventions is taken over a city for our weekend oh, in so cosplay fun. and stuff like that because you get the best reactions from people that have no idea what's going on and we've actually had instances where we've kind of talked people into going to the con that yeah there was a lot yeah like had no previous knowledge about it or were even into this culture like they were just kind of like oh like i i've heard of dragon ball Z or whatever you guys call it. Whatever you crazy <laughs> kids do. Uh, but this seems kind of cool. I want to check it out. And that's the thing I love most about conventions. It's such an awesome culture that uh, the people themselves create that kind of suck people into it that have never experienced it before because mm-hmm. we're just having a grand old time just being ourselves and it's really contagious. I still love when you're walking down the street in a cosplay, the car passes and you look at the people in the car and you just hear, what the fuck? Yeah, just... <laughs> like, I, you don't hear it, but their face just screams it. Oh, yeah. And uh, I'm surprised there's not more accidents in the city of Lancaster <laughs> when that time comes around because there's so many people looking out the window. Like, you got people with, like... You know what's happening? Yeah, it's... I'm uh, scared. Mommy... Uh, I I just love it. It's great. But, yeah, guys, so that wraps up our first podcast. Let us know what you think. Uh, Give us suggestions, comments, likes, hopefully not dislikes, but anything. Uh, Just let us know what you liked about us. And, actually, what we kind of would like to do with this is that if you hear anything that you just know for a fact is wrong, correct us. I we ask you to be polite, but if you want to yell at us, fine. We're, we're, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, but just correct us. We're not going to be offended. This is yeah, as much of a learning tool for us as it is a way to express our love for this culture. Exactly. We're far from perfect. I know I'm going to make a ton of mistakes with my knowledge. Uh, probably even my favorite subjects like Mega Man. So, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, just yeah. just let us know what errors we'll make, uh, we make, and we'll address them in our next podcast. Yeah. So until next time, guys, have a good one, and we will see you uh, hopefully in a week. Peace.